Junkyard 4467, wind 200 at 10, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear to take off. In 1969, the world watched in awe as NASA astronauts stepped foot on the moon. Apollo 11 was a stunning American victory and achievement that changed human history. But the Gemini and Apollo programs were expensive, exceedingly dangerous, and nerve-wracking for all who watched. America and the world needed a less taxing way to explore the new frontier. The space shuttle program would be the fourth human spaceflight program run by NASA. It was officially called the Space Transport System, STS but I'll refer to it as the Space Shuttle Program for the duration of this video. The goal of the Space Shuttle Program was to, by utilizing reusable components including the orbiter itself, make regular space travel affordable and reliable. More specifically, NASA needed to affordably transport crew and cargo into space in order to carry out various missions. The Space Shuttle Program officially commenced in 1972, and the idea was that the first space-worthy space shuttle would be ready to assist in the assembly of an American low-orbit space station by the 1980s. Enterprise would be the first orbiter in the Space Shuttle Program, so it was constructed without engines and other components necessary for spaceflight. Five years after the commencement of the Space Shuttle Program, Enterprise initiated the program on February 18, 1977, when it flew to high altitude on the back of a modified Boeing 747 called the Shuttle Carrier Aircraft, or SCA. Enterprise did not leave the back of the SCA during any of the first five test flights, but on August 12, 1977, Enterprise was finally released from the back of the SCA at an altitude of 24,000 feet, marking the first time a space shuttle flew on its own. After gliding for 5 minutes and 21 seconds, Enterprise landed near Edwards Air Force Base in California. Similar test flights were carried out four more times to train the crew on how to guide the shuttle down to the surface after re-entering the atmosphere. These tests were critical for the future success of the program. Since the orbiter would not be powered once it was back within Earth's atmosphere, it would be critical for the crew to be able to reliably set up for landing on each first attempt. With preliminary testing complete, NASA's second orbiter, Columbia, was preparing to launch the shuttle program into space. On April 12, 1981, Columbia was launched from Kennedy Space Center, officially commencing the first space shuttle mission. The goal of STS-1, as the mission was called, was to test the shuttle's performance in space. Commander John Young and pilot Bob Crippen returned Columbia safely to Earth two days after launch. Before we get further into this video, I want to remind you to hit the subscribe button. If you're interested in transportation, history, or both, you'll want to know when a new video is posted. If you have something to say, make sure you leave a comment below. Okay, back to the video. STS-1 had been successful and the program was underway. Columbia would fly the first operational mission, STS-5, in November 1982. This mission would launch multiple communication satellites. Okay, Mike, uh, we deliver. We got STS off on time. And if you're interested, I'll read you the pad. Roger, go ahead. STS-9, also carried out by Columbia, would be the first mission to include the Space Lab module, a reusable lab carried in the orbiter's payload bay. The work carried out in the Space Lab was so successful that STS-9 was extended by a day. In the end, 72 experiments were completed in the Space Lab, which validated the idea of including non-NASA individuals on space shuttle missions. These individuals were selected for single missions and trade as payload specialists. In the case of STS-9, Ulf Merbold was selected from the European Space Agency to work in the space lab aboard Columbia. After STS-9, the mission numbering system of the space shuttle program was temporarily changed, but I won't go into the new system in this video since it was only used for a small number of missions. The years between 1983 and 1986 saw great success of the shuttle program. Three orbiters entered service with NASA, Challenger in 1983, Discovery in 1984, and Atlantis in 1985. Many communications, research, spy, and military satellites were deployed by various missions carried out during this time. Two classified missions, STS-51C and STS-51J, were flown for the U.S. Department of Defense. The shuttle program was already making space accessible to researchers and leaders around the world. On January 28, 1986, seven people boarded the Orbiter Challenger at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Challenger was set to carry out a routine mission, STS-51L, which involved launching a tracking and data relay satellite and another small satellite to study Halley's Comet. Among the crew was Krista McAuliffe, a high school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, who was selected to be the first participant in NASA's Teachers in Space project. 
McAuliffe was scheduled to conduct two class lessons from orbit, which would be transmitted remotely to students on Earth, with the goal of emphasizing the importance of teachers and to encourage students to aspire to join high-tech fields. After several delays, Challenger lifted off at 11.38 Eastern Standard Time. Less than one second into the launch, gray smoke was visibly coming off the right solid rocket booster. For the next two seconds, more puffs of smoke spewed from the rocket, but the launch had already begun, and so it continued. 58.79 seconds into the launch, a flame became visible and quickly grew into a larger continuous flame. A structural failure caused the hydrogen tank to fail, releasing liquid hydrogen and sending the tank itself upward into the intertank structure, resulting in an explosive burning of the fuel and breaking up of the entire shuttle apparatus. From the perspective of the viewers watching the launch on television, Challenger seemed to spontaneously explode, rocking the world and the shuttle program in the process. All seven members of Challenger's crew were killed in the disaster, and the shuttle program would be grounded for two years while changes were recommended and implemented to reduce the risk of future accidents. In the meantime, the United States' domain over space and space exploration were in question. The world would rely on agencies other than NASA, such as the European Space Agency, to carry out routine and necessary missions in space. Three. Deux, un, feu. The two-year hiatus resulted in many technical changes as well as a return to the original mission numbering system. STS-26, carried out by Discovery, launched on September 29, 1988, two years, eight months, and one day after Challenger's tragic breakup. The Challenger disaster had forced the postponement of the deployment of the now-famous Hubble Space Telescope. Originally scheduled to be deployed in October of 1986, NASA had no choice but to wait. The orbiter Discovery did successfully deploy Hubble in 1990, along for a steady stream of key scientific discoveries including contributions to humanity's knowledge of the age and expansion of the universe. Hubble is still operational today and is expected to remain in service until the mid-2020s. With Challenger in the past and Hubble in orbit, the shuttle program continued its mission to provide a routine and reliable link between the surface of the Earth and Earth's orbit. The program continued to allow for countless experiments, satellite deployments, maintenance, discoveries, and technological advancements. At the same time, though, the program continued to struggle to keep up with demand and keep costs low and affordable. In February 1995, Discovery rendezvoused with Mir, the world's first modular space station, which was operated by the Soviet Union. This rendezvous and future dockings with the Mir space station can be viewed as a symbol of success for a program aiming to make space accessible across the globe. Even more notable than the shuttles supporting Mir space station is its role in assembling what would become the International Space Station. The International Space Station, or ISS, was conceived in 1984 when U.S. President Ronald Reagan directed NASA to build an International Space Station within the next 10 years. America has always been greatest when we dared to be great. We can reach for greatness again. We can follow our dreams to distant stars, living and working in space for peaceful economic and scientific gain. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. In November 1998, Russia launched the first component of the ISS. And the next month, December 1998, saw the launch of the first U.S.-built module of the ISS, known as Node-1. Node-1 was the first component to be deployed and assembled by the space shuttle and its crew, serving as the link between the Russian side of the station and the U.S. side, as well as being the area where the crew would eat meals together. Node-1, also known as Unity, symbolizes the cooperative and international nature of the station and the space shuttle program itself. The space shuttles ultimately would complete 26 more ISS assembly flights over the next 13 years. In fact, moving forward, most of the space shuttle missions would be focused on assembly, supply, and maintenance of the ISS. STS-107 would be one of the few missions in the second half of the space shuttle program that would not be related to the ISS. Columbia launched on January 16, 2003, with Ilan Raymond, the first Israeli astronaut, in the crew cabin, and a space hab double module in the payload bay. The goal of STS-107 was a purely scientific pursuit. Over the next 15 days in orbit, the crew of Columbia would conduct many experiments, including experiments to examine the physics of combustion, soot production, and fire quenching in microgravity conditions. Columbia re-entered the Earth's atmosphere on February 1, 2003. The shuttle would have to shed 17,000 miles per hour to reduce its speed to just under 200 miles per hour before it could land at Kennedy Space Center. Columbia glowed from the heat that re-entry produces. This was normal. 
Communication between the shuttle and NASA was cut off. This was normal too, because of the hot gas that surrounds the shuttle during re-entry. All was normal, but Columbia was doomed. During the launch 15 days earlier, a piece of foam had fallen off the external fuel tank, damaging the heat shield on the leading edge of the left wing, leaving an opening for the immense heat surrounding the orbiter to enter the spacecraft, compromise the structural integrity of the craft, and eventually cause the orbiter to break up over eastern Texas. All seven crew members would be killed in the accident. The loss of Columbia, the second catastrophic event of the space shuttle program, caused the shuttles to be grounded for two more years following the disaster. Similar to the aftermath of the Challenger disaster, an investigation began into the contributing factors to the loss of Columbia and its crew. But a secondhand statement from John Harpold, former director of mission operations at NASA, might be just as telling as the investigation itself. You know, there's nothing we can do about damage to the thermal production system. If it has been damaged, it's probably better not to know. I think the crew would rather not know. Don't you think it would be better for them to have a happy, successful flight and die unexpectedly during re-entry than to stay in orbit knowing there is nothing to be done until the air ran out? Following the Columbia disaster, President George W. Bush called for NASA to work toward getting the space shuttle fleet back in service in order to complete the assembly of the International Space Station. Once the station was complete, the space shuttle program would come to an end, with the possibility of a replacement down the road. Once the shuttle program resumed, it continued for another six years, but every mission after Columbia, with only one one exception revolved around the assembly, supply, or support of the International Space Station. By 2011, the ISS was all but complete. Two missions carried out by Discovery and Endeavor in the first half of 2011 would deliver and assemble the final modules. Finally, in June 2011, Atlantis lifted off for STS-135 to deliver a cargo bay full of supplies to the ISS. I wanted to give you a final uh, goodbye. Hey, thanks, Fergie. We'll be watching you from the uh, SM windows, and uh, you guys look really good on the fly around from what we can see. And uh, again, thank you so much for all that you guys uh, have done for us up here. We really, really appreciate it. And at dawn on July 21st, 2011, STS-135 touched down at Kennedy Space Center, marking the end of the space shuttle program. After rolling to a stop, Commander Chris Ferguson captured the moment perfectly in his communication to Houston. Our mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and has come to a final stop. You know, the space shuttle's changed the way we uh, view the world and it's changed uh, the way we view our universe. There's a lot of emotion today, but one thing's indisputable. America's not going to stop exploring. Thank you, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Endeavor, and our ship Atlantis. Thank you for protecting us and bringing this program to such a fitting end. God bless all of you. God bless the United States of America. The space shuttle program was a symbol of American vision and success on the new frontier. At times, the program struggled to keep up with demand and public expectations. There were difficulties with cost and the program was hurt by two devastating tragedies. But ultimately, the space shuttle served America and the world well by improving accessibility to space, fostering international cooperation, and achieving scientific advancements while establishing the foundation for the future.